If you have your Bibles this morning or have access to one in the rack in front of you, I'd like for you to turn with me <clears throat> again to the scripture that we have been looking at, kind of a jumping off place for several weeks. I want to shift our emphasis a little bit today, but in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we have one of these places that I think often occur in Scripture, and that is where the whole gospel message, the whole message of Scripture, God's whole purpose for us, is summarized. And this would be one of those where in the middle of the sermon, or say there's a chapter to go, after warning his disciples of all the detours we can take in the Christian life that will lead us to wreckage, he then urges, more than urges, he commands. If there's ever a lifetime commandment from God that requires a lifetime commitment from us, this is it. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. These things means, what do we eat, what do we drink, where do we live, what do we work, what's my job? All these things, they're important, but Jesus said, don't make them the most important. I will take care of them so that you can give your heart to this single pursuit, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we've been talking about the kingdom of God, what that means, what the kingdom is, what it isn't. Last week, we looked at how do you get into the kingdom of God. It's by abject uh, repentance and turning from sin and renouncing allegiance to the kingdoms of this world and the values of this world and bowing the knee to Jesus. That's how I get into the kingdom of God. I am upon entering the kingdom of God by repentance and faith. I am then a new citizen of God's kingdom. And you can't have a kingdom without a king or without subjects. And we are subject to Jesus. He is our new king. We follow him. We listen to him. We pay attention to his word. What is he talking about when he also equally commands? Seek his righteousness. Not ours, but his. This is always, I should say, or nearly always, interpreted as a further, deeper quality of my Christian life. It is an ancient truth that there is such a thing as a why in the road in our life, a watershed where we enter the kingdom of God. Before then we weren't, but now we are. We call that conversion. We call that being saved justification there are being born again in fact Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3 3 unless and in that conversation Nicodemus is kind of preparing himself and he's bringing these questions to Jesus and he said he said we know that you are a teacher come from God no one could do the things you're doing unless he's from God and if you read that passage as we did a week or so ago Jesus seems very abrupt, almost rude, and he just cuts him off. 
it was like, listen, I don't want to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. And of course, he knew that. Jesus knew what he wanted to talk about. And he just abruptly cuts into the conversation and says, unless you are born from above, you can't see the kingdom of God. See means experience. No. I can't, I don't get it until the light comes on in here. Then I can see it. But having entered the kingdom of God, the Bible is full and church history of every denomination and doctrinal persuasion. Everybody recognizes that there is a deeper need of the Christian. I just reread some of a little book that is still in print. It's been, it was written in 1960 <clears throat> and written by um, Raymond Edmund, then president of Wheaton uh, College. And it's just called They Found the Secret. In his introduction, he talks about the shining examples all down, not counting the Bible, but in church history, of Christians, he said, whose lives were typified. He said there's a general pattern. Lives who were typified by a clear conversion experience. They turned from darkness to light, from sin to God and were rescued from the practice and the slavery to sin and took up a new pathway and walked with God. Did that for some time and then began to plateau spiritually, began to run into something that they couldn't even put their finger on, but there was something that was dragging its feet within them. Something that after a while they came to see as a deep hindrance to what God wanted for them and what they wanted to. And that inward something James calls being double-minded and the condition of being double-minded would almost always bring these saints of God to almost their wit's end. If you've ever read, most many of us have read Oswald Chambers' devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, he makes a radical statement after about four or five years of being a Christian. He says, I came to the place where I felt if this is the fullness of victory in Christ, I'm afraid it's a fraud. And that's a strong statement. But he said, Christian, the Christian walk for me became such a struggle with this inward undertow that I nearly cast it off until I found there was a deeper work. Edmund's little book collects people like Oswald Chambers all down through history, Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Anglicans, Methodists, didn't matter. That's the point. The point is, it isn't a little province of certain denominations. It's in the Bible, and it's all through history, and the Holy Spirit keeps calling people to His righteousness. Yes, we have to get into the kingdom of God, but all of those who are subjects in God's kingdom, He draws to a likeness to Him. And that's what righteousness is about. Seek first, uppermost, and is ultimate. His kingdom and His righteousness. I think there's a real parallel here 
that I'll touch on for a minute and then move on. In the lifetime of lots of people in the Bible, but Jacob. Jacob was a rat. He was a deceiver. Um, he was a con man. And he knew better. He grew up until he was 15 or 16 years old. He sat around the fire and listened to Abraham, his grandfather, the friend of God, talk about the things of God. Jacob knew better. But Jacob didn't walk that way. And fleeing his brother Esau, who he had tricked out of the, the birthright, which was a double inheritance because Esau was born before he was, He's fleeing him, and he goes to a place called Bethel, and he camps for the night, and he is heading north and east from Palestine, and he's fleeing Esau, who said, I'm going to kill him. As soon as my dad's dead, so he won't be around to see it, I'm going to off the guy, sick of him. So he flees, ostensibly to look for a wife. While he's at Bethel, God appeared to him, talked to him, woke him up spiritually. And Jacob met God there personally. Oh, he heard about God from Abraham and from his father Isaac. But he, he met God. Everybody has to have a personal meeting with God. When my heart is brought from darkness and death to life, my eyes open, I see. Jacob named that place. It had been called, well, when he got there, it was called Luz. And Luz means almond orchard. Not too dramatic or sensational. It's not real spiritual. At night, lost, dark in his soul, wicked, enslaved to sin, Jacob makes camp at the orchard of almonds. In the morning, it was a different person. And Jacob woke up and he said, why, God's here. And up till now, I never knew it. That's the picture. You see why Jesus said, you have to be born again or you can't see it. And Jacob said, why, God is in this place and I never even knew it. And the place called the Nut Orchard the night before it was now, had got, it got a new name. And it remains that all through Scripture. Bethel. You know what Bethel means? House of God. God's abode. He's here. Jacob went on his journey. He goes to his father's family. And he spends 20 years there. Working the first seven for a wife. Then he gets, he gets tricked. It's dark. Remember, they didn't have LED lights then. They have the wedding. And because the older daughter in their culture couldn't be married, or the younger daughter, who Rachel, who Jacob loved, could not be married off until her older sister, Leah, was married off. And apparently Leah um, wasn't as good looking as Rachel. And Laban, their father, figured if I don't get her married off, I mean, I, I, we, we got to do something here. So Jacob says, I will work seven years for Rachel. And they seemed, it says, like a week for the love he had for her. And then when they have, they're all veiled, and when they have this wedding, he substitutes Leah. In the morning when the light dawns, he finds out he got married to Leah. And Leah, the scripture says, King James says, was tender-eyed, and the Hebrew supposedly says dull-eyed. Okay? I don't know any more than that. We won't explore that any further. Laban, who was Jacob's, every bit Jacob's equal as far as a con man, said, I'll tell you what. Yeah, I know I kind of tricked you here after working seven years, fulfill Leah's week 
you got to be married at least one week to your first wife before you can get a second one. That's not a bad arrangement. Um, he says, then we can marry Rachel to you for whom you'll work another seven years. So there's 14. Then when he gets done with that, he works six more years to collect his own flocks and so forth. And then after 20 years of Laban changing his wages 10 times and ripping him off every which way you could, finally, God spoke to Jacob. He says, head back home to your father Isaac. And he heads back. And on the journey, he gets nearly to the Jordan River on the way back. And they're at a little creek little tributary, and they make camp. He now has 12 children, two wives, all kinds of flocks and herds and servants. He's wealthy. Things ought to be going good for him, but a messenger comes and says, you remember your brother Esau who 20 years ago said he was going to kill you? We don't think he's forgotten about it. He's on his way, and he's got 400 armed men with him. No kids, no women. That sounds like an army. He panics, and he decides he will divide up all he has, including his families, to save some of them. And he divides up all of his flocks and herds, and he sends droves in, in, uh, with spaces between them to try to placate Esau. Tells the servants, go to Esau, meet him, and say, hey, this is a gift from your brother Jacob. And before he gets over the huge wealth that is, here will come another one. We'll, we'll wear him down. And then he sends over Leah and her children. And he sends Rachel and her children. And then the scripture, and it, this is not just giving us information. God knows what he's saying when he says things. And Jacob was left alone. That's where God had been trying to get him, really, ever since Bethel, when he first got into the kingdom. Jacob still had some of his old traits. He was a different person, but way down deep in his heart, he still had a bent. Like every Christian, we are born again, but we're still double-minded. The good news is, I don't care what you hear today, and I know what you will hear, that nothing can be done about that. That bent can't be dealt with until we die. That is not the truth. We have a better atonement than that. Our Savior did a better job than that. Jacob, then it says, a man wrestled with Jacob. And Jacob was hard to deal with. And this man that wrestled with Jacob, finally, to bring Jacob down, struck him, and it says his hip was out of joint. Now, I've never had a hip out of joint, but I hear that that's somewhat uncomfortable. And the angel, and he knew that's who it was, struck him and his hip was out of joint. And then he began to hang on, no longer to fight, but to just hang on. This had gone on all night. And the man wrestling with him said, let me go. Day is breaking. And Jacob said, before you go, bless me. And the angel said, this is, this is so good. Jacob wanted a blessing. He wanted God to do something for him. But there's a price. There's a price for a blessing. And God named it. What's your name? I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me. God said, tell me your name. What? God knows his name. But he had to get Jacob to where Jacob would say, my name is Jacob. And the word Jacob 
means heel grasper, deceiver, crook. He was named that at birth because as the second of twins coming out of the womb, he grabbed a hold of Esau's heel and they named him on the spot, heel grasper, trickster, someone who comes along behind and trips you up. A conniving kind of a disposition deep in his heart. And God said, you tell me what your name is. That's the price. You want a blessing? I know the kind of blessing you need. And I'm sure Jacob, Jacob's blessing was in terms of possessions, power, safety from enemies, safe trip home to Isaac, victory over Esau, smash Esau. He's coming with 400 soldiers. Stand up for me against him. Give us victory here. All the things that Jacob probably meant when he said, I want a blessing from you, God knew better. No, you don't need all that. He says, I'll take care of all that. You need to deal with what you are clear in here. And he said, what's your name? Heel grasper. Crook. Deceiver. What did God do? Well, now we can't deal with that in this life, so we're going to have to have you just struggle with that the rest of your days, and we'll cover it, and we'll overlook it, and then when you die, you'll get victory. He didn't say that. As soon as he said, my name is Jacob, he said, we're not calling you that anymore. You just got a name change which signifies a nature change. He said, we're going to call you Israel, Prince of God, you've won a victory. And then the scripture says this, and he blessed him right there. That's not a lifelong struggle for some ideal that you can never reach. God changed him right there. Ninety years later on his deathbed, Isaac or Jacob had been true, really, to what Jesus said. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He'd been true to that because 90 years later on his deathbed, he'd seen wars and famines and trouble and good things, and none of that did he mention. He laid his hand on the heads of his grandchildren and blessed them. He said, the God who met me at Bethel and the angel that I wrestled with at Peniel. Bless these boys. He named that place where he wrestled with the angel in the morning. That next morning, Peniel. Remember at night, he went to bed in the nut orchard and got up in the morning and said, this is the house of God, Bethel. 20 years later, he wrestled all night at a place called Jabok, which was a uh, just a, a um, little bridge over a creek, a wading place. In the morning, it says when the sun rose on him, he named it Peniel. Peniel means face of God. See the progress there? In, I'm in the house of God at Bethel. But he said, here... I see God face to face. And he said that. I'm naming it face of God because I've seen God face to face. My life's preserved. Ninety years later, he said, the angel who redeemed me from all evil bless these boys. That's what Jesus is talking about. Seek the kingdom of God. Have your own Bethel experience. Second, Seek your own penile experience where I see God face to face and he sees my heart. What did Jesus say in this same sermon on the mount earlier in chapter 5? Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what? See God. We need a Bethel experience. We need a penile experience experience. This little book that I referred to, 
records then the lives of a number of saints down through history who in their own way, in their own circumstances and own temperaments, came to a second why in the road where they died. They, they surrendered themselves. The point he makes is that the heart of sin is really self-sovereignty. It's self-righteousness. It is self-rule. And until I absolutely abandon myself and my agenda and my ambitions and me, I am thwarted from the deep truth of heart purity and righteousness. Righteousness is not just good acts. Righteousness is a character. Righteousness is a nature, a heart like God's. Um, a few of you got a little printout of a hymn and not very many of you got it because it was, we got our wires crossed and I changed my mind late. Actually, it's probably my fault, but I'm not going to take blame. Um, someone in the office is going to lose their job um, <laughs> or someplace somebody's getting fired. But um, we started passing it out. We'll pass it out next week. It's another Charles Wesley hymn. Oh, for a heart to Praise my God, a heart from sin set free. <clears throat> That's the deep need of every Christian to come to a place where I surrender. This little book also reminds us that there are, well, I don't know, I was going to say hundreds, not hundreds, but scores maybe, of terms that are used to describe this. There's the sanctified life. People use the term the crucified life, the surrendered life, the deeper life, the more abundant life, holiness of heart, spirit-filled life. There are a number of different terms, but the interest is usually connected in some way to a doctrinal denominational position. But the interesting thing is the content's all the same. People came to a place where they got, they saw self obscuring, hindering, me, 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 and using God rather than Him using me. First time I saw that clearly, I'd heard that there was a deeper work for every Christian. But the first time, first time I personally saw it really clearly, um, was probably six months after I got saved, and I was in Bible college, and I got my first invitation to go speak. And um, speak at a youth retreat, a um, little snow trip, ski trip. And so I wanted to, the people that invited me knew my dad, knew that he was, you know, they thought he was a great preacher, which I think he was. And so I'm his son, I got to produce here. I got to look good. I got to come off good. I've got to hear good things about myself. And God, you got to help me. To do what? Serve you? Or look good? God just talked to me plainly. You're praying like mad. Oh, God, help me. So that you will look good, and they won't be sorry they invited you. But this doesn't have anything to do with my kingdom. Christianity, Christianity finally reaches its full fruition in my heart when we quit promoting self, doing the work ourselves, having one eye on my benefit, my advantage, my promotion. Jesus said it well just before he was crucified. He said, if a kernel of wheat doesn't drop into the ground and die, it remains alone. 
it's useless. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. If we're going to be what God wants us to be, if we're going to follow Jesus' command here, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his nature in my heart. I have to die. There's a point when I have to say, Lord, I quit. I give up. I surrender. You do with me what you wish. No more defending myself and contending for my agenda, Lord. Thy will be done, whatever it is. That is the point of breaking and the point of death. But listen, there's absolutely no greater point of liberty and freedom and life and victory. That's where it's at. We really start living when we have our own penile experience. Jacob was never the same. He was never the same. And he always referred back to it. That's where God did a work in my heart. And you'll notice that, that that's where Israel, the name Israel came from, for the nation. He changed. Let's decide whether we fe forget feelings. When we know God's will and when he's done his job to tell us what his will is, I shouldn't have to require, oh, and Lord, by the way, carry me along by a, a, a rising tide of feelings so it'll make it easier. No. If he says you seek the kingdom and you seek my righteousness, then let's do it. That's it. Let's decide this fundamental commandment. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness will occupy my soul and uppermost endeavors in my heart. Bless your hearts. I think we are in increasingly difficult days. We are in an increasingly hostile, openly hostile world. We better have our anchor deep. We better have the peers of our spiritual household down on bedrock. That's how Jesus ended this whole sermon. He said, if you hear my words and you do them, you're like someone who dug deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And he said, if you hear them and you don't do them, you're like someone who built his house on the sand. You're going to face wreckage. I just do my best to commit, commit into God's hands this truth and let him apply it to your hearts however he sees it needs to be applied. Dan, if you will come and just dismiss us in prayer, I want you to just maybe let's have a minute or so of stillness. Let God talk to our hearts and resolve. I'm going to seek God with my whole heart.